welcome to uh, episode 89 of Brews Less Traveled, the podcast exploring the best uncharted beer scenes across the U.S. I'm your host, Brian, and we're continuing our way through Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Please join me in welcoming the CEO and co-owner of Remedy Brewing Company, Matt Hastad. How's it going, Matt? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. We we uh, we messed up our guest name last week, and I completely forgot to ask you: uh, Is it Hastad? Has Todd? Did I did I even get that right? Hastad is actually correct. Um, it's it's Norwegian, so Hastad is how it's pronounced in Norwegian. But uh, here in America, Hastad is pretty close, close, pretty close enough, right? Exactly. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so we're going to kick things off before we jump into our beers here with our quick sip questions, as we always do. These are fast questions uh, where we want fast answers, and it'll help us to get to know you fast. Are you ready? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So favorite non-remedy beer? Oh, um, the the beer that started it all for me, uh, Sam Adams Winter Lager, shockingly. Uh I've I've always loved to see that. That was the first time I ever had a beer that was outside of your yellow fizzy water, and so it was kind of uh, open my world to craft beer. I love that answer. That's one of my uh, that was one of my early favorites too. Mm-hmm. Oh, so I still have a soft spot for it. It's it's not as highly ranked as I used to have it in my my favorite beers, but I I just have that that serial connection to it. You know. Yeah. Um, no replacement for it. Right. Uh, uh, Czech or German pills? Ooh, uh, I'm going to say German pills. Okay, okay. Favorite new trend in craft beer? Cold IPA or craft non-alcoholic beer? I think craft non-alcoholic. Uh, the reason for that I, for me personally is every once in a while you kind of find yourself having a few more in a month than you planned on. Uh, so I, I like to take a month off every once in a while and uh, go sober months and Problem is, there just hasn't been a lot of really good NAs out there that fill that itch for a month. So by the end of it, you're really kind of jonesing for that uh, really good flavor again. Um, so I, I like the craft NAs. Cold IPA, I, I've got a love hate with that that style. Uh, Matt, your favorite local outdoor spot? Oh boy. Um, so Falls Park uh, is a major tourist attraction in Sioux Falls. A uh, really beautiful uh, waterfalls right in the heart of the city. Uh, there's a little, yeah, exactly. There's a little uh, off the path, uh, unknown area where I like to go and just sit and collect my thoughts and stare at the water um, when I'm I'm having either good days or bad days. And uh, you don't really get disturbed, but you get away from the throngs of people that are down there. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then our final quick sip question. My favorite quick sip question. Have you ever seen Bigfoot? <laughs> Twice. Anything in... It, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Once in northern Minnesota and uh, once in western South Dakota. So they're out there. No way. No way. Okay. So I always ask this. Is like uh, This is like my fishing question that I really just ask as a joke. But um, do you care to go into more detail? Sure. sure. Uh, so I was on a whitewater canoeing trip uh, in... Uh, northern Minnesota, um, and it was a really fun and interesting trip when I was out there with a, a large group of people, and I was about a week long, so we were tenting uh, throughout and, you know, hanging our food away from the campsite, you know, so for, so the bears don't get after it. And I, I swear uh, it was either a, a giant bear on his back paws or a Bigfoot, but the way he was swinging his arms had to be, had to be Bigfoot for me. And then uh, out in the Black Hills... Uh, staying in a, at a buddy's cabin out near Custer, South Dakota, out in Custer State Park, and uh, doing some hiking and climbing, and there was just a big crash in the brush, and we, we saw the top of the head running in a, a just a, a straight line away from us. Um, so that was my, my second experience with it. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Oh, my mm-hmm. God. Uh, we've had, we've featured some Pacific Northwest, sh- uh, cities on this show, such as Bend and Boise, and, uh, none of them had that cool of, uh, Bigfoot stories. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Thanks for joining us. And, and, uh, let's jump into the beers. What would you, uh, what would you like to tell us about the wonderfully named Hefe Metal? <laughs> Hefe Metal. Um, 
that is probably my daily sipper that we do brew. Um, what I love about this beer um, is that we we get a really nice banana and clove characteristic out of that. Um, the way we get it to kick off those uh, phenolics and those esters is we stress the yeast out incredibly uh, when we brew that beer, specifically to get it to be uh, hyperactive and kicking off those those flavors and uh, scents. Um, what I love about it is it is one of the simplest beers that we brew when it comes to recipe creation, but so flavorful, nice, light, easy to drink. Uh, we keep the, the mouthfeel on that on the little bit lighter side uh, when it does come to heffy, so it's not as thick as some out there, um, and just a fun beer. And we've gone uh, toe-to-toe with that in a couple big competitions I can't name because we didn't place, uh, but we, we typically will make it into final flight. Uh, with that beer, and we're always always toe to toe with some of the really big players out there, uh, especially one of them being uh, Van Stefaner, which is the brewery that invented the style back in the 1600s. Um, so there was one competition where we actually beat Van Stefaner in that one, and that was whoa phenomenal. So just just fun to see. Uh, uh, we we're always <laughs> we're always the bridesmaid, never quite the bride when it comes to that beer. But uh, for me, it's it's my favorite that we do. Um, I will be honest, Matt. Uh, uh, Hefeweizen is is one of the styles that I order least frequently, but um, this is one of the most balanced, uh, drinkable examples I've I've ever had. The like you said, the banana, the clove, it's there, but it's not it's not assertive. It's not over the top. It's it's part of the cohesive product that is this beer, and I think that's that's probably one of the reasons why it does so well in those competitions where they're judging it to style of what should be a Bavarian Hefeweizen is it's, it's very restrained and very well balanced and uh, just an immensely enjoyable example of the style. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's one of our better sellers, uh, both for the name and for the product itself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, people buy with their eyes or their funny bone or whatever you know <laughs> it's so important to have a good catchy name on it too and uh we we had a a brewer uh back when we first started who was just a a complete metalhead and so every time that he'd come into the brewery no matter what he was doing it was just loud as could could be in the brew house and uh so when it came time to name this beer that was definitely in honor of him and he was he was a big part of that heck yeah, well, shout out to another fellow metalhead. Um, so you're uh, one of three founders of Remedy, uh, yeah. along with Jason Davenport and Tyler Jepson. This brewery was founded all the way back in 2013, eventually opened in 2017, and now through year number six. How has that relationship with your two founders evolved over these years as the brewery evolved? Uh, I think it's it's a combination of everything. So we've grown closer in certain aspects and definitely further in others because when we first started this, uh, you know, two of us weren't married. You know, we didn't really have families. It was a lot of that. And through this, all of us have found, you know, love, children, and uh, found ways where, you know, our days were so much more fulfilled. Um, so we don't hang out outside of work nearly as much as we did in the beginning. Um, but that relationship of knowing how they work, you know, now and uh, being in each other's face, you know, 10 hours a day, every day, it's kind of one of those things where you, you really get to know somebody on such a core level of who they are. Um, and so it's been fun to see those relationships evolve that way. Uh, but you do kind of miss the, the the good old days back when, you know, it was a bunch of single dudes in a garage brewing beer, uh, you know, and just all we did was talk about the best beers that we've ever had, the worst beers that we've ever had, what we wanted to do, you know, and that dreaming of getting the brewery open. Um, so you do miss miss some of those because now sometimes you forget and, and get so bogged down in the day-to-day uh, that you have to take a step back and go, this is cool. Like what we're doing is so much fun, uh, and we can't believe where we are. Just even after, like you said, being open, uh, we're in our sixth year actually having product to the market. Um, 
which is weird because it took us four years to get doors open and the struggles that we went through in those four years um, and how that brought us together too. Sure. It's yeah. been, been fun to see those relationships. I love how the website described it. Uh, uh, basically, an idea is created in, in your head. It, it cooks in Tyler's brain, who has a, a biology background, a very scientific approach, and then kind of gets put into place by Jason's hands. He's, he's the kind of hands-on guy in the mm -hmm. brewery. Is that still kind of how things go these days? No, uh, we've evolved so much from that, too. Uh, yeah, that, that is how it originally was. I was the uh, creative. I was the idea guy. I was the guy that was like, I want to find a way to put this flavor into a beer and make it work and balance. Tyler was our, uh, our, our yeast nerd who was really, really good about making sure that what I was doing and how we were treating our yeasties uh, was on point. And Jason was our day-to-day -day um, if you cut a quarter, I'll cut your hand off kind of guy. So it was really good for us um, to have all of that. Now we've grown to the point where, you know, we've got a team of six different brewers. Um, and so all of them have their own input and say, um, we hired a director of operations now. Uh, I moved more into a sales and distributor relationship role. Uh, Tyler has moved more into a... Um, Accounts payable, receivable, and then he does a lot of like warehousing and making sure that we have lead purchasing. Um, and then Jason actually just recently um, decided that he needed more time with his family. So he ended up uh, leaving the company in a day-to-day -day role, but he's still on as, as an owner and has some say in the company. Um, so we hired a, a director of brewing operations who's been with us for three years. Um, and he moved up into a role where now he's in charge of a lot of the beer scheduling and what's coming down the pipeline. But the fun part about it for me and Tyler is we still get to sit on on all of the recipe creation meetings. And when we decide what to brew, um, we're still a big part of what that looks like. We just get to filter it now through, well, we have Tall Tyler and Short Tyler, I should say that. So Tall Tyler is our director of operations because he's six seven. And oh short, Ty short Tyler is six four, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, short Tyler. Exactly, he goes. I've never been short in my life until you know we hired him. So, <laughs> but uh, so we still kind of filter everything now through Tall Tyler to make sure it fits into the schedule and we have what we need in order to to get it done. Um, but it really allows us a lot more flexibility because. We've got a small five barrel system that we can just play around with as our pilot system. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of really fun, crazy, funky, experimental stuff. Um, and then we've got our, our production system, which is our 30 barrel plant that kicks out about 6,000 barrels a year. It's not anything massive yet, um, but we're hoping to keep growing it. So as we uh, we keep this moving, we're, we're looking to keep uh, evolving and changing and hopefully keeping up with the times. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that that pilot system because that leads me into my next question. But first, as I've uh, this this half of Bison has warmed up a little in my glass, that the banana is coming through wonderfully. I just you know it's funny for a style that I normally would not order, and that's one of the reasons why I love doing this is I get those I get to drink these styles that you know I'm set in my ways when I go to a right. brewery I order the same styles over and over yeah. again. I get to drink these things that kind of push me outside of my comfort zone. And uh, I'm, I'm glad, I'm very glad in this instance that it's uh, pushing me outside of that comfort zone. But um, back to innovation and, and where the brewery is going, especially in terms of like beers and styles and recipe development. And um, you're kind of located in... You're not kind of. You're located in what is kind of a, a craft beer or beer hotspot in Sioux Falls. Uh, you're right around the corner from Covert, right around the corner from uh, the Monk's House of Ale Repute. And uh, how does Remedy work to set themselves apart and distinguish themselves in a, in a growing and, I mean, dare I say, bustling craft beer scene? Yeah. Um, for us, number one focus has always been on quality of product. Um, so that's a 
big thing for us is um, we get a lot of praise, uh, even from people that are traveling through, that come from big beer meccas, uh, such as such as Portland or Seattle, will come through and say, wow, you guys have a great scene, and this is my favorite just because the quality of the beer stands out. Um, but secondarily, a big push for us, um, we're still kind of in the middle of, you know, bush light old Milwaukee country. So we're we're much further behind in when it comes to craft beer scene than a lot of other parts of the country. And that's just kind of how our area is. We're always a few years behind whatever the latest trend is. So we're still in that mode of trying to get people away from their tried and trues and get them into craft. Uh, so we always focus roughly half of our menu at any point in time on approachable, easy drinking styles that aren't going to bend your mind to the point of, oh, I don't like it, push you out too far outside of the comfort zone. So we always want something familiar, but something challenging in every single one of the beers that we produce. And I think I think it'd be easy for an outsider to look at that and be like, oh, Sioux Falls needs to catch up with everybody. But mm -hmm. there is something really important to be said for playing to your market. And it is something I have seen so much in doing this show over the past year is that you go into those towns like like uh, like Sioux Falls, like uh, Omaha, Nebraska comes to mm -hmm. mind, mm -hmm. Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Missoula, Montana where you're going to see golden ales and amber ales and a big portion of the menus being those approachable beers like you talked about. And I think that's a really testament to the business owners and the brewers in those areas to not just, oh, let's do what everybody else is doing. No, we need to brew beers that people in our area are going to understand and are going to be able to make that transition from their tried and true. It was kind of interesting. Um, and we'll talk about it when you get to it. The second beer that we have is our Queen Bee. Um, so Queen Bee was kind of our, our flagship and founding beer. And when we were putting together our business plan and going through it, and we were talking to other breweries that were open at that time, we got a lot of flack on trying to push Cream Ale as our flagship. Uh, we got a lot of people that kind of said, there's no way you can found a brewery on a Cream Ale. And it's a testament to that in our market here that over 50% of our distribution in every market that we go into is that singular beer. Um, so it is a beer that resonates with our crowd. Um, and that's kind of one of the big things with craft beer. When craft beer first came to South Dakota, it kind of had a snobbish alienation type feel to it, where if you came in uh, to a beer bar and ordered a Bud Light, they laughed in your face and would, would say, yeah, whatever, and walk away and not even offer you a craft beer. We, we, we took offense to that because we all started in the same place. We all grew up drinking our dad's crappy beer out of his closet. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why fight that? Why not embrace it and create an easy bridge for people to get into craft beer because the world of craft beer is so vast and so wonderful. If all you've ever known is you were headed an IPA once at a, at a bad party uh, and you didn't like it, but nobody told you why or what it was or tried to explain it to you, you're going to be turned off from craft beer and go, nope, going back to my safe zone. I want to stay there. I'm comfortable there. That that was exactly what we were fighting when we decided to open a brewery. We wanted to get a place where people can see what craft beer is about. And and that's not to say that there was nobody around here drinking craft beer. I mean, of course, in every market, you have that niche that knows it. And, you know, your your whale hunters, you know, your, your Ahabs. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but we... We, we had a few, and we had uh, the mass of our population that were not familiar with it. And they loved traveling to the coasts, and they'd come back and rave about a craft beer scene, but we just didn't have one. Um, so that's what we wanted to do. Yeah, that, uh, that's awesome. I cracked, I cracked my queen bee while you were oh, nice. talking about it. Um, I, it's, I'm blown away that that's that, not blown away, but it's really great to hear that this is 50% of your distro in any market that you go into, this is this is a, a unique beer, but still a very approachable beer. Uh, what else could you tell us about the uh, Queen Bee Imperial Honey Cream Ale? Uh, that's the brewery founder because that is what I used to convince uh, Tyler Jefferson to leave his job in cancer research and dive into opening a brewery. 
Um, so like I said, he was the one who was married at that point in time. And that was the beer that we brewed that convinced him and allowed him to go to his wife and say, Hey, this really cush, awesome job that I have in cancer research, I don't want to do that anymore. And I want to make a beer. It's <laughs> a good, good convincer. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and truthfully, uh, I have to give a shout out to Shelby for her support because without her support, we would not be where we are. Um, but it was a beer that Tyler challenged me and said, you know, I, I like, you know, a specific brand of light beer. What can you brew that I would want to drink instead of that? Um, and so this is, this is what I came up with. Um, the, the particular light beer that he liked, I won't drop names on that one. Um, was on the sweeter end of the spectrum for light beers. Um, so I thought adding a honey element to it, I always like to do something that kind of pushes the envelope a little bit. So I added a lot of honey to it, which took it out of range for a standard cream ale um, when it comes to alcohol content. Um, but it really dried it out really nicely, made it a nice thin body, easy to drink, and left just a little bit of sweetness on the back end of the palate. Um, and it's mainly clover and wildflower honey that we use in that one. Um, and you can really kind of get that little bit of a sense of a meadow in that sweet honey if you if you really look for it in there. Um, but it was, again, our, our palates in the Midwest tend to lean towards the sweeter side of things. Um, so it was a beer that I knew would do well for us. Um, and it's 7.5%, which at that point in time, I was very big into IPAs and, you know, higher alcohol beers. So I wanted something that was light but still high alcohol, uh, and that's where, where Queen Bee came from. Get some bang for your buck. Yeah, very much so. It is it is a detriment and a blessing for that beer because we have people that buy it specifically because it's higher alcohol, and we have bars and restaurants that will not put it on specifically because they like to sell you know, your 32-ounce mugs, and they were putting it on for the same price as any other beer and people would have one or two when they were used to drinking three or four and they were stumbling out the door not understanding what was going on so um <laughs> we almost had to put a warning label on there it's uh, a it's a troublemaker beer yeah it is uh, we always say we have the uh, after work groups that come down and they'll sit around a table and each be drinking now two or three queen bees until the first one gets up to go to the bathroom and kind of finds their sea legs a little bit and then the others uh, kind of look and find religion in the bottom of that glass real fast. So it's uh, <laughs> it's it's a fun beer for us. Oh, that's yeah, that's great. It's it's a it's a real troublemaker, a shit stirrer, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, people people need that. That and that's what um that's what I, I I've been thinking. Drinking it is it's so smooth. It doesn't really show that that alcohol. Um, that alcohol content of, of almost seven and a half percent and i could see yeah you uh start tipping a few of these back while you're sitting down and then uh you go to get up and do something and it, it could really really hit you hard yep. um uh we, we've referenced the website already but i i really really like the website I really like the the layout that's easy to navigate was able to pull a lot of information off of there in addition to the articles and stuff that i i found elsewhere but uh there was something from the about us section that i really liked that i wanted to touch on um it jokingly said that uh sioux falls itself decided it needed a better craft beer scene in 2013. um as yourself, as somebody who's, you know, watched that scene grow, do you feel like there was a crowning achievement in that growth of the Sioux Falls beer scene? I don't know if we've hit it yet, truthfully. Um, what's amazing to me about Sioux Falls is the way that the city has embraced craft beer. Um, like I said, we found it in 2013. Um, there was one brew, monks uh, had a small, small brew house, like a, a barrel size or less. Um, and so they were kicking off some beers earlier. But in the year before us, in the year that we opened our doors, so that 2015 to 2017 range, uh, there were four breweries that opened up that were the first four in Sioux Falls since 2004. And the one that was open in 2004 was only open for a couple of years. It was just a little bit before its time. Um, and so prior to that, it was kind of one of those things where 
all of the brewers that opened, we were all in a homebrew club together. Uh, so all of us were kind of going back and forth at different tournaments. We knew who was good at what. We knew uh, what each of us was going to focus on. We kind of had this really easy and beautifully laid out plan for all of us to really succeed. Um, we opened up. The community embraced us so well. Um, and more and more people decided, you know what, I want to leave my job for this. Now, uh, I think in and around Sioux Falls, we have 10 breweries uh, just in our area for 200,000 people. So it's it's quite a few for um, our population size. Um, and what's crazy about that is each still does something better than the others. Uh, and I think that's what's so beautiful about it for me. So when you say crowning achievement, I think just being able to put Sioux Falls on the map as a really good beer destination is probably our crowning achievement. Um, the state of South Dakota now this year should surpass 50 breweries in our state, um, which may not sound like a lot, but when you're a state that has less than a million people, uh, it's it's a significant amount of breweries. I um, want to say it's number 10 in terms of per capita breweries. Let me fumble sure. to pull up the BA statistics here, but I'm pretty sure South Dakota is yeah number 10 in uh, per capita and breweries per capita. Not Kentucky, come on. <laughs> so well, and what's my way. What's crazy yeah, number 10, 6 6. 6.6 6 .6 breweries per capita ranks 10. Well, and that's 10. fantastic. Yeah. What's crazy about that is it goes back to the pre pre-prohibition times for us where every small town in America had its brewery. And that's truly the model that most of the breweries in this state have of the 50 breweries. I think five or six are trying their hand at either self-distribution or uh, some sense of distribution, um, but the rest don't. They are your mon pa. We want to be a tap room. We want to be a place for people to come in, get what's new, what's fresh, what's hot. And they're happy and love to be doing that and go deep in their own uh, micro communities. Um, and I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing for us because we can all push each other and uh, still have our own little designated niches that we really, really excel in. Um, but at the same time, that that constant need to be better and push each other and that free flow of information back and forth between like, hey, I tried this and I found out that it added, you know, extra body to my stout where I was doing, you know, a six hour boil before, but I found I could do four hours by adjusting this or that in order to get the same results. Um, and just that knowledge base that's passed back and forth amongst all the brewers is uh, fascinating. And it's really helped us um, explode. How do you think the scene can still be improved? And what role do you think Remedy uh, plays in that improvement? Um, knowledge. And that's, that's the biggest thing for us. Most of the brewers in this area come from a homebrew standpoint. Um, so there's not a lot of outside industry experience in this state. It's getting better, um, but you don't see a lot of people leaving a brewing job and moving to South Dakota to open a brewery. Um, Remedy, myself, and uh, co-founder Tyler um, have been involved with a local uh, university, and we just this January uh, got a brewing miner up and off the ground. Um, so I oh heck yeah yeah. So uh, I've, I've been an adjunct professor there uh, trying to figure out how to teach, uh, which has been kind of fun. But it's uh, that is what I'm really, really excited about seeing is more people who actually know about brewing, who know the ins and outs, of the science, getting into it, um, who know what they're getting into when they're opening a brewery. Um, I've heard it from many brewers who say, I just want to brew beer and I opened a brewery and now I don't get to brew beer. <laughs> you know, and so um, getting people uh, understanding what they're getting into, that there's a business side of things, there's a science side of things, there's the brewing, there's the quality control, um, and just pushing all aspects of that so we have a better educated workforce to keep improving and making making bigger jumps. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I just was thinking of what kind of joke I was going to make about adjunct professor. Yeah. <laughs> chocolate or oats 
<laughs> but we'll, but we'll, we'll, we'll just move right past that. Um, so we've talked about the beer scene. We've talked a little bit about the natural environment and the beauty around Sioux Falls. But you, Matt, what is one thing that you wish Sioux Falls was more well known for? Well, we're very much known for its friendliness. Um, but I think what I love about Sioux Falls is the entrepreneurial spirit around here. Um, and it's been that way since Sioux Falls was founded. Um, we're in the middle of tall grass prairie. It's beautiful, but it's harsh. Uh, we, you know, we get down to minus 40 degrees in the winter and we get up to 105 degrees in the summer. Oh, so boy. we, we have extremes is what it is. We're not near an ocean that can kind of help moderate our climate. We have none of that. Uh, and so we, we are a hearty people who, uh, aren't afraid to help their neighbor. And I think that friendliness really does well. But for me, I think that entrepreneurial, I can get it done. I don't need to go somewhere else in order to make my fortune. Um, we're really starting to see that in Sioux Falls. And it has allowed the culture of Sioux Falls to just explode in the last 15, 20 years. Um, so it's it's such a cool city. Um, our downtown area is beautiful. I would say one of the most beautiful downtowns in the United States. And it's so walkable um, that it's just such a such a fun place to come. Yeah, that's one of the things that kept coming up in my research was how walkable the city is and how it's mm -hmm. it's so well laid out to to explore. And I also love that I love the entrepreneurial spirit answer, and I, I love that that's something that that exists in in Sioux Falls. That you know, if somebody says you know I want my local community to look more like this. They don't just say that. That's not where that stops. They find a way to do it. They find a way to make the area around them reflect what they want it to be, reflect those ideals. And, you know, that eventually will lead to the best community possible for those residents. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's it's one of the things that you'll hear a lot of people talk about. There's been a lot of effort on revamping the downtown. Um, when I was going to school here uh, back in the early 2000s, I don't want to date myself too much, but... Uh, you didn't really go downtown. It was kind of a sketch area. Um, there was a lot of transient activity down there. Um, and instead of just kicking the transients out, Sioux Falls put a lot of effort towards a lot of different programs that we can do to help people. And there was a, an influx of investment into that area to just beautify it um, and really make it a, a fun area for people. That's awesome. Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls sounds like an awesome city, and uh, we're halfway through exploring it on Brews Less Traveled, and we've we've tasted beers from two awesome breweries. So, uh, it, it just just great to hear the good things that are coming out of that area. Matt, you've mentioned distribution. Um, before we wrap up here, where can people get Remedy Beer? Sure, uh, we're distributed in the entire state of South Dakota. Uh, we are in Minnesota, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, in the southwest part of Minnesota as well. Um, northwest Iowa currently, and uh, in Nebraska, we're in Lincoln and Omaha as well. So we are in four states currently um, with some plans to keep biting off more chunks of territory slowly. Um, our growth model is to try to go deep before we go wide. Um, so it's something that we hope to keep slowly building our brand and keep slowly uh, getting people excited about us. That's awesome. Well, uh, if you're in any of those areas, Omaha, Twin Cities, uh, Des Moines. Did you say Des Moines? Nope, Northwest Iowa. So we're Northwest working Iowa. on Excuse Des Moines. Me. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. So uh, there's an area called uh, <laughs> the Lakes region. Um, it's Okaboji in Iowa. Yes. It's yeah. amazing. And that that is a big, big focus for us this year. Well, if you're in any of those areas, definitely go and check out, uh, see where you can find Remedy Beer. There's a beer finder on the website where you can you can locate it and um, make it out to Sioux Falls to check out their tap room and their amazing beer patio. We, we didn't talk about the patio at all, but the patio looks pretty sick. So 80% uh, of our business in the summer, and it's been voted best patio in Sioux Falls multiple times. It's, it's wonderful. Heck yeah. Uh, well, that's going to do it do it for us for this episode uh thanks again to matt for joining us and thanks to remedy for these awesome beers for both the show and for our beer club 
Uh, as you know, you can go to Bruvana.com to explore subscription options and get great beers like these shipped to you on a monthly basis and then also get the opportunity to, to join our discussion live as we record these shows. We'll be back next week uh, with a, another featured brewery from Sioux Falls. But until then, stay safe, be kind, and support local breweries, everybody. Cheers. Thanks for watching Brews Less Traveled on YouTube. Be sure to uh, like this video and subscribe to our channel for more interviews with brewery professionals.